Welcome to the Young Turks. We got a crazy show for you. Mental today. Mental. Okay. All right. Here's what's happening. Number one, uh, we got Afghanistan coming out of the ears. Like later in the show, I'm like, why can't I just stuff Afghanistan back in there? Uh, because I got two guests on Afghanistan coming up, and then uh, we're going to cover the Obama speech live, play by play. Ben, Man- ben Mankiewicz is going to join us to do a little play by play on Obama's Afghanistan speech. Afterwards, boom, I'm on MSNBC. Forget about it, but you can watch it right here. Why? We're going to steal their thing and then show it here. Anyway, shush, shush, will you? Okay. Uh, anyway, so and then we'll do a little debate. I'm going to be on the side of uh, leaving Afghanistan and thinking that Obama's decision is not the great one. But I want to listen to what he has to say because there's a couple of nuances to it as we're going to explain as the show goes on. And then in the third or the fourth hour, whatever's going on with Anna, uh, I got this. We got this story on temporary marriages that I just love. They're called Muta. Okay. And you, you don't want to miss that story. That's my favorite story of the day. All right. Now, having said that, I'm rushing. You can, can you sense it? Can you feel it? You don't want it? Because i got 100 stories to get to before we get to Afghanistan. So let's get started. Remember the guy from yesterday? Maurice Clemens uh, shot the four cops in the Seattle area. Uh, it turns out he'd been um, released from prison in Arkansas and in Washington. And a guy who commuted his 108-year prison sentence in Arkansas was Mike Huckabee. Now, Mike Huckabee is a commuting and, uh, you know, uh, releasing prisoner fiend. I've made up that phrase, and it's kind of clunky. <laughs> okay. He released, in his ten and a half years there, over a thousand people, uh, either pardoning them or commuting them. Okay. And that is um, more than the other three governors of Arkansas before him in 17 and a half years. So he releases... 1,033 people in 10 and a half years, Bill Clinton, Frank White, and Jim Guy Tucker granted only 507 uh, pardons or commutation of sentences, so about half as many in 17 and a half years. So now that begins you begin to wonder, hey, what's going on with Mike Huckabee? Why is he releasing so many people? And if you remember, one of the famous uh, people that he released was Wayne Dumont, uh, who was a rapist and had raped Bill Clinton's cousin, I believe, and then uh, went on to rape and kill others. And that caused a significant political trouble for him uh, the last time he was running for president in the Republican primaries. In fact, an ad ran against him talking about the Wayne Dumont case. And now Maurice Clemens. What's going on here? It turns out, as I spe- suspected yesterday, and this is not definitive, I, I always want to be clear with what are facts and what are you know, analysis or opinion, right? It, it looks like uh, it, he was impressed with his newfound religion in prison. And if they made a religious appeal to him and appeal to his Christian side, he was much more likely to uh, you know, grant uh, a commutation of sentence or, or just a flat-out release. Now, for example, uh, the last uh, governor of Arkansas, or the current governor of Arkansas, has only uh, done that, pardon people, after they have served their sentence. And that's very common saying, hey, you know what, this case was wrong, it shouldn't have gone this way, so I'm going to pardon you. Now, if you know a case is dead wrong and he's in the middle of serving a sentence, by all means, go ahead and pardon him or commute the rest of his sentence, however you want to handle it. In this case, he didn't think Maurice Clemens' sentence was wrong. Uh, He just felt that he was 17 when he committed the crime, to be fair to Huckabee, right, so he was a minor. And um, he wrote about how he had, you know, uh, been touched by Jesus and that when the angel of Uh, death and uh, came and took his uh, beloved mother away and that really touched him and changed him and Huckabee wept and wept and then all of a sudden let him go. And then of course he immediately went on another crime spree. Now what I can't believe is that governors fall for this stuff. Look, on the one hand, I want to say, hey, you know what? He's got a little bit of mercy and that's not something you see in a lot of Republicans. I almost kind of want to give him credit for at least being open-minded on that and to some degree being merciful, right? But on the other hand, you can't get blinded by like, oh my God, he loves Jesus, I love Jesus, yeah, let him go. Because the jury gave him a 108 year sentence for a reason. They thought he was really, really dangerous. I mean, that's how our system works, right? And it turns out they were right. He was really, really dangerous. Uh, Earlier in the year, he punched a a sheriff in the face. He uh, was up on child rape charges. I told you this yesterday, he had his, family and young relatives stripped naked 
uh, uh, a little earlier uh, again this year, and he said, it's okay, the apocalypse is coming, and I'm Jesus. I mean, the guy is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, right? So, I mean, I feel kind of bad for Huckabee here, but at the same time, he's got to own up to it and say, look, my bad. Now, of course, what's he doing? Oh, full backpedal. Backpedal, backpedal, backpedal. He's, oh, no one could have seen it coming. It's not just my fault. It's also the prison system in Arkansas and the prison system in Washington and the prosecutors, la, 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 la. And they go to the pre prosecutors in Arkansas. They're like, what are you talking about, man? Both times when he was up for parole, we came out and said, no, 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 don't, don't parole this guy. Now, that's different, right? Because he was in jail so many times. Parole is different than getting your sentence commuted, as uh, Huckabee did, right? But when he was up for parole, we said we didn't want him uh, getting out there because he'd committed multiple offenses. Do you know that before Huckabee commuted him, in the time that he was in jail, and that was over a decade, but he had over two dozen violent offenses within jail. Now, jail's a violent place, so... Okay, I'll take it with a grain of salt, but over two dozen, that's a lot, right? It's not like it appeared that he had evidence backing him up that he'd found Jesus <laughs> and a more peaceful route. You see what I'm saying? Look, everybody writes those letters, and he doesn't write it. His lawyer writes it for him. Oh, yeah, I love Jesus just as much as you do, Mike, and oh, la, 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 la. Come on, let my client go. I mean, bounds of reason. I want you to be merciful, but I don't want you to be a sucker. So, of course, Clemens goes and shoots uh, four cops, and... But the good news is today they got him. Uh, a cop spotted him at 2.45 in the morning uh, in a stolen car, uh, and uh, he found him, and he got, came out and said, all right, put your hands up, and uh, Clemens started bum-rushing the cop, and boom. So the cop put him down, and uh, he's dead. Uh, so he's been, um, he's been killed, uh, and uh, it appears from the story that the cop didn't have any choice, so that's the way it goes. And look, uh, one last note on the cops in this case. You know, we do a lot of stories where we get on the cops, right? But they got a dangerous job, man. I mean, they're sitting in a coffee shop getting ready for the day. And a madman comes in. He didn't shoot anybody else. He just shot all four of those guys point-blank rage. They never had a chance. In fact, one of them, after getting shot, managed to pull his gun and shoot uh, Clemens anyway. But uh, they got a tough, tough job. So don't forget that every time we do the tasing stories, okay? A little of both, right? And we've got to find some balance there. And... And the cops do a great job most of the time, okay? All right. Now, speaking of guns, I got one more gun story for you. A uh, reporter for Bloomberg has found out that uh, the executives at Goldman Sachs are beginning to get gun permits in New York. And New York City has confirmed uh, that, yes, many of the executives at Goldman Sachs have asked for gun permits. They won't release their names yet, uh, but they might do so later, okay? And when she asked about it, you know, basically, people don't want to be on the record, but they're saying, well, you know, never hurts to be prepared when <laughs> the public gets so enraged by our bonuses and they come for us. At least we're going to be carrying heat. <laughs> now, they're, in New York City, they're not allowed to carry it around. I mean, you could get a permit for that, but it's extraordinarily difficult. They just have a permit for uh, having the guns in their house now. But it's an interesting sign of what they think might be on its way to give you a sense of uh, what they sensed earlier, two months before Bear Stearns went under, uh, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, um, uh, Lloyd Blankfein, asked uh, police if he could do a security gate at his house. So, and he got special permission from the local authorities to do a security gate. I mean, like, obviously he knew, mm, something's going to hit the fan, right? And uh, I don't want it to, to come over into my house, so let me get a security gate. And now they're all apparently, not all, but a lot of them are buying guns. And that's an interesting development. All right, then um, th there's this, um, okay, you know what? Let me do a credit card story here for you guys real quick. A couple of, speaking of the financial world, a couple of financial stories for you guys. Uh, this is sent in by Tom Hank, you know, who's part of the show now. Uh, it's about uh, a credit card company called Fifth Third Bank Corp. Uh, they're big in the middle of the country, in Cincinnati, and, uh, and I saw them in Indiana. By the way, they have the worst name for a bank of all time. What the hell is Fifth Third? I, I, don't, I still don't know what that means, a Fifth Third. That's the most cumbersome, awkward name in the history of all banks, let alone anything else. Okay, anyway, so uh, they got a clever new policy that a lot of other credit cards uh, companies are thinking of adopting, including Bank of America. So it's very relevant, very large. Um, where they say, you know what, if you don't use your credit card that much, we're going to charge you anyway. Now, wait a minute, I didn't use the credit card. What are you charging me for? 
I'm charging you for not using your credit card. So let me get this right. If I use the credit card, you're going to charge me. That's right. Uh, if I don't use the credit card, you're going to charge me anyway. That's right. <laughs> okay. They're like, oh, no, no, new regulations are coming, and we're not going to be able to make as much money off of you guys as we used to, uh, so we've got to find different ways and new and innovative ways to rob you right now. So anywhere from $19 to $29 to Bank of America is thinking of $99 if you're not using your credit card. Now, if all that wasn't bad enough, if you say, hey, you know what, uh, okay, well, then if uh, I don't want you to charge me for a credit card I'm not using, let's go ahead and, and uh, close that account. Well, that's great. But you know what happened? That means your debt to credit ratio, meaning the amount of money you've borrowed to the amount of credit you have, once you close that account up, goes down. And hence, it hurts your credit rating. So you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you close the account, that hurts your credit rating. If you don't close the account, they charge you. You use the account, they charge you. You don't use the account, they charge you. They charge you no matter what. That's crazy, man. And this is the kind of stuff that they get away with and they've been getting away with for so damn long because nobody's minding the house. And to be fair here now, there are some regulations coming and that's why they want to try to you know, get all this in place before those regulations kick in and someone actually looks into what they're doing and how badly they've been robbing us for all this time. Man, that stuff would drive me crazy. And if I'm going to pay for, you know, a credit card, then, you know, I'm going to keep it real. Why don't I go to Amex? I mean, they got a hundred different things that they offer for whatever service that, and at least they're upfront about it. They're like, yeah, we're going to charge you a yearly fee or whatever, right? So, and then, of course, you guys all know about what they've been doing in the past, the other credit card companies, where they'll say, yeah, you know, you were paying whatever it was, 9%, 19%, 14%. We decided, even though you did nothing wrong, arbitrarily we're going to raise your interest rates. <laughs> I don't know why we put up with this crap. <laughs> okay, well, I do know why we put up with it. It's because those guys then go by the politicians, and the politicians don't let us <laughs> regulate these companies. And then the Republicans that are the most adamant about that will then turn around and say, oh, we're fighting for you, the little guy, while Obama's coming to overthrow the Constitution, which makes no sense whatsoever. But again, here, to be fair, rare case where our, some of the politicians did the right thing here in at least beginning to regulate this out of control industry. All right, now, one more thing about uh, the financial industry in this segment. Um, Mark Warner is on the warpath. He's a Democratic senator from Virginia. And he's saying, hey, remember the whole point of um, the government helping out during this recession was to stimulate the economy? and." get some money, for example, uh, to the small businesses. Not necessarily give it to them, as we did with the banks, but lend it to them so that they hire new people and produce new products, et cetera, et cetera, and we st stimulate the economy. That's how it's supposed to work. Now, the problem is Tim Geithner and Larry Summers gave all the money to the big banks and said, oh, do whatever you like with it. Oh, no, no, you have, we put no conditions on it for all intents and purposes. Some, but they were comically uh, easy to get around and, and not cumbersome. Um, and you don't actually have to lend out the money at all. So they didn't. They just kept it so that they met capital requirements so they could continue to make their derivatives bets. You think they care about your small business? And I talk to guys out there now trying to get loans for their business, for real estate, whatever it might be, and they say it's near impossible. The rates are through the roof. So what Mark Warner is saying is, hey, I got a crazy idea. Instead of keeping funneling that money uh, to TARP and to the big banks, why don't we take some of that unused TARP money and give it to the local community banks and when we give it to them, attach a condition. In fact, two very smart conditions. One is, if we give you the money, you got to lend it out to the small businesses. We're not giving it to you for our health or for your health. And number two, if you make money off that, we're going to share in the profits. Hello, McFly. Of course, that's what you should do. It's the most sensible thing in the world. So, you want to guess who's fighting it? I mean, it's a broken record, right? Of course. Tim Geithner at the Treasury Department. <laughs> he looked at this thing and he's like, Senator Warner, I don't get it. How do the big banks make even more money from this? They don't. Why would the Treasury Department be in favor of something that the big banks don't rob the American people from? This thing makes sense. No, 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 we're against it. <laughs> Look, sometimes I wonder, I mean, is Obama 
you know, minding the shop here? Is he, does he know stuff like this is going on? Or maybe he does, and he's on board with Geithner and Summers. That's why he hired him. But, and I'm not saying this is the end all and be all, and that this is the one regulation that makes perfect sense and we can't live without it. But it certainly is worth looking at and not fighting and saying, hey, look, if you don't like it, Tim Geithner, t give me a reasonable you know, reason behind why you don't like it. Because I can't figure it out. So tell me what's wrong with it. They won't even respond. They're like, yeah, yeah, no, not interested. No, my friends at J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs told me that they're not making any money off that. No, not interested, Mark. See, we'll get to it later. That's what they're saying. So you're going to get to the one thing that actually helps later as you continue to funnel the money to the big banks. It's crazy. It's nuts. All right. Now, speaking of, you know, how we've been telling you or I've been telling you over the last couple of days, I'm a little worried about Obama, to say the least, whether it's the financial industry stories we've been doing, whether it's not pushing for a public option, uh, and, or whether it's Afghanistan, which, of course, in a little bit we're going to do a lot of today, right? Well, a UC Berkeley professor by the name of Robert Van uh, Hoobling uh, did a presentation at Stanford, actually, and uh, he explained that he um, got, uh, basically did a study where he got a bunch of people uh, to say how they would vote based on positions that politicians had. Okay? And what he wanted to see was, do they pick up more votes if they change their positions or do they lose more votes? Now, that's really interesting. At first, when I was reading the initial part of this, I thought, well, it de would probably depend on the issue. And if you're saying that flip-flopping costs your votes, well, that might be because those people are in moderate districts. And if you're in a more conservative district or in a more liberal district, and you have an incentive to stay with your position, but that'll have you win more because, it, because you're already in safe districts. But no, it wasn't. He didn't take real politicians and real issues, et cetera, because it would have complicated matters. It would have put all those variables into play. He did something smarter. He said, all right, look, I'm going to tell you that this theoretical politician has this position, and theoretical politician B has this position. And then he tested how they would affect their votes if they changed their position or they didn't. And it turns out that if a politician uh, stays with the principles that they had without changing it, they get 57% of the vote, including people who don't agree with them. But if they're consistent, they respect that and they vote for that anyway. That's a really interesting finding. But the politicians that switch their positions, now whether people agree with them or disagree with them, only get 43% of the vote on average through all these different issues. So the quote unquote flip flopping politicians lose 14% of the vote on average as opposed to the p politicians who remain consistent. Now there's a lot of lessons to, that you can get from that. Number one, you can see why the country is more polarized because you have incentives for politicians to quote unquote stay the course and even if things change around them, even if situations change, not to change their minds. That's the unfortunate, con one of the uh, unfortunate conclusions that you get from this. Now the, but when you guys know and we know that's not really the case in America. The Republicans stay the course, right? But the Democrats don't follow this, you know, apparent, you know, fact of politics. They haven't caught on to it. So, you know, the very famous case of John Kerry, of course, uh, being for the Iraq war funding before being against it, the flip-flop, flip-flop, et cetera, it doesn't work. When you try to, and unfortunately, that has big consequences for Obama, because he seems to be always trying to split the baby and split the difference and say, hey, you know what, I'm a little for this and a little for that. Yeah, I promised you change, but now I'm not going to give you as much change. I'm going to go more towards the right wing, etc. And you know what? That exudes weakness. And I hope, I know the Republicans get this idea. I hope the Democrats read this and understand that uh, that, that has a political price. Even if you switch to a position that the country agrees with more. And it definitely varies position by position. For example, if you switch uh, to a pro-life position, funny enough, pro-life people are more open-minded. They're like, hey, come any way you like, okay? As long as you come to our side, we'll vote for you, okay? Now, that's a, not an entirely true statement, but it's more so than other issues. But overall, on average, 
flip-flopping costs your votes. So why do the Democrats keep doing it? Why don't you actually deliver the change that you promised to the voters? You're going to be shocked to find out you'd actually get more votes that way. Put some thought behind it. Young Turks. Welcome back to the Young Turks. Uh, now, uh, we begin our marathon Afghanistan coverage. We're going to begin it with uh, Brigadier General, retired uh, Anthony Tata. He's also the author of Rogue Threat. Uh, General Tata, uh, welcome to the Young Turks. Hi, how are you guys doing? It's uh, Tata, actually. It's uh, one of those good Italian names. So, okay. Um, it, well, for a guy named Cenk Uger, I should be better with people's names. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, hey, I've been called worse, trust me. And, and it's, you go by General Tata? I go by Tony or, or whatever anybody wants to call me. <laughs> no, but, I'm going to uh, stick with General Tata. All right. Uh, so it, it, we're going to find out today um, that uh, Barack Obama, we believe, is going to say uh, he's going to want 30,000 more troops in Afghanistan and that they've got an exit strategy for about, it appears, three years. That's, those are the press reports that are out there. Do you think that's the right strategy? Let's start there. No, I, I disagree with the timeline aspect to it. The Taliban and Al Qaeda have this saying that you Americans have the watches, but we have the time. And so I, I think any time you start talking in terms of exit strategy, uh, the people of Afghanistan begin to uh, make decisions um, not to be supportive of the insurgents or of the uh, uh, military forces over there because. Uh, they know that they're going to have to live with this sort of enduring Taliban presence because we're just going to be gone. And, and so it, it can't be an open-ended commitment, but it's got to be an enduring presence that, you know, much like we did with uh, Germany and the Cold War and all that, this, this is an equal kind of threat, in my view, to uh, freedom people all around the world, uh, freedom-loving people all around the world. All right, so let's, let's break that down a little bit because, uh, you know, I, I've always thought – I never understood that argument about the exit strategy because obviously we're going to leave at some point unless you're saying, hey, no, we bunker down in Afghanistan for decades, for as far as the eye can see, like in Germany and Japan, and we have bases there for the next 20, 50 years or so. Is, is that the idea? I mean, that seems like an unbelievable commitment to Afghanistan. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, what McChrystal said is 10 years. Uh, from August 30th. So, um, and he's the guy on the ground, and I've been on that ground. And uh, right now, it's a half-baked strategy to begin with because we're not in Pakistan. And I'm I'm a firm believer that we should have been in Pakistan from Jump Street on this thing, and that the Bush administration pulled out way too early of Afghanistan. I never understood why we went to Iraq. We should have focused in Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and built our strategy from there because uh, if, if it's unbelievable that we're going to be in Afghanistan, think about Pakistan and the nuclear state. Think about India, one of the you know, fastest growing nations in the world. This is a uh, traditionally neglected area of the world. It would not be bad uh, to have some troops in Afghanistan, have some force in Afghanistan, and then look in the other direction at Iran. This is a volatile region, and so thinking about this as sort of the new paradigm the, uh, where we had Europe and the Cold War in Japan. Uh, now, now what we've got is sort of an India, Pakistan, Afghanistan base that we've got to really be thinking about. And I know it's unique and different, but it's, it's certainly, I think, the direction that we're going. Uh, and I should make clear that Brigadier General uh, Tata was the Deputy Commanding General of the US's, uh, U.S. Army's 10th Mountain Division and the Combined Joint Task Force 76 in Afghanistan. So uh, you've been there. Now, but you said something very interesting there. You said we should have been in Pakistan from the beginning. What do you mean by being in Pakistan? You don't mean invading Pakistan. I, I, yeah, I, I mean troops. I think we should have had Green Berets on the ground uh, in Waziristan. The enemy's got a sanctuary in there uh, that uh, they're, they're recruiting, manning, training, equipping, sustaining, deploying troops. They're doing all the functions that a nation state does right out of uh, uh, was Iristan, and so the only way to get at that is to have troops on the ground. And we knew that was going to happen because we helped the the Mahajideen during the uh, Soviet wars, and that's where we operated out of. So it was very short-sighted of Rumsfeld and, and President Bush to to not have an overarching strategy that included boots on the ground in Pakistan. But how do you? Guys, I, I I got one minute before a live TV shot. I hate to do this, but um, 
uh, and someone just waved at me and said, I need to come in and, and get ready for a TV show here. All right, then we're, I guess we're going to have to let you go then. All right, uh, Brigadier General Anthony Tano, the author of Rogue Threat, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, and I hope to join the program again. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Look, we came to him a little late, so uh, that was less time than I had anticipated. He's an interesting character, so I, you know, maybe we'll get him on the show again and talk to him because he's, it's not, he's not, doesn't fit uh, neatly in the mold of conservative or liberal. Uh, he believes that we should tax the wealthy to keep that war effort going on for the next 10 years or more, as he uh, partly explained there. And he thinks, you know, the Bush and Cheney made a terrible mistake by going into Iraq. But on the other hand, he thinks we should be in Afghanistan for, you know, as he explained there, for a long, long period of time. I would have loved to have asked him, and we'll do it next time, uh, to what end? Uh, we're going to have a guess about that uh, in the next segment. Uh, so let's take a quick break here and come back with that and some more uh, non-Afghanistan stories for you guys. Young Turks. All right, back on the Young Turks. Uh, we have another interview on Afghanistan coming up in a little bit. And then, of course, uh, President Obama is going to speak, and we're going to cover that live at the top of the hour. Uh, and Ben is going to join me uh, to do play-by-play -play on that, and we'll do some analysis of that as well. Uh, maybe we'll um, hear more from the bodacious general, uh, Tata. <laughs> I've been getting some crap in here for that. <laughs> Apparently, it's obvious that you shouldn't pronounce his name that way. All right, so now i got more foreign policy stories for you guys. Uh, apparently, it's Foreign Policy Day today at the Young Turks. Remember the days when it used to all be foreign policy? Okay. Oh, look. <laughs> look at this. Ben Mag was already in his house. I what just, happened? I just want to be fair. Uh -huh. Like, it wasn't necessarily obvious that you screwed up his name. It's mm -hmm. just that as soon as you said General Tata, I had just sat down, and I was like, oh, that can't be right. And JR was laughing, and everybody was laughing. I don't know how you would necessarily pronounce it. I just, would, <laughs> I just couldn't believe that that was actually happening. And then, to make matters worse, he's like, yeah, uh, just for the record, I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> no, no, as soon as he paused, I was like, oh. oh what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> And I, I was telling these guys, I've literally seen a porn in my life called Bodacious sure. Tata. Yeah, it's like one of the first sort of dirty things you say when you're a kid. Like when you're a little older and you learn the word bodacious, you're like 15, and you're like, look at those bodacious tatas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, followed by uh, Bubanis. I'm just saying nobody with the last name Tata rises to the rank of general in the United States Army. <laughs> just that, that guy doesn't go that route. <laughs> All right. So now, uh, more uh, foreign policy stories for you guys. Um, Haaretz is reporting. Uh, Haaretz is a paper, of course, in Israel, and they're reporting that um, uh, the ha president of the EU, who, which is now a, a Swedish president, uh, is put together a document saying uh, not only should there be two states, but East Jerusalem should uh, definitely be the capital of the Palestinian territories, and they should stop all settlements, uh, the Israelis should. Uh, now, of course, they say they should have no violence uh, on the part of the Palestinians. Everybody knows that. That's uh, expected. Uh, but the Israelis are uh, outraged by this. But here comes the really interesting part. He's saying that the EU should consider unilaterally accepting Palestinian statehood. So without, I mean, he wants to encourage the, the peace talks. He mentions that in his you know, uh, you know, outline of the things that the EU should push for, et cetera, et cetera. But even without the peace talks, to accept uh, unilaterally the Palestinians saying, okay, we're now officially a state and our capital is East Jerusalem. Now, that kind of shakes things up because then, you know, obviously Israel's not going to be happy about that. And they still lay claim to East Jerusalem and apparently the Israeli government not too happy about this. What goes on in East Jerusalem? Is it like East Hampton or is it not quite? Why? Is it Tony? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> um, what? Uh, but is that? Uh, I and you know, obviously, I, I actually. Am, it's a, there's a legitimate question in there, and maybe you don't know. But is uh, from a how do Palestinians? Not I'm saying not that you represent one, but what mm -hmm. are their thoughts on East Jerusalem? Is that an acceptable alternative? And are there particular holy sites in East Jerusalem which makes it yeah. uh, which makes that uh, a horror for Israel to even consider giving up? Yeah, no, this is the old, you know, uh, question that they've had for, since the end of time. Look, 
people roughly believe in the 1967 borders. Now there's going to be some negotiation over that. Obviously, they want the West Bank, and they want the Gaza Strip, but uh, also uh, the Palestinians have forever wanted East Jerusalem, and the Israelis are saying, have said since 1967, no, 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 we own all of Jerusalem. It's our capital, and we're not having that discussion. But in reality, of course, they do have that discussion. That's part of the negotiations back and forth. Everyone has always assumed that they would split the city, but the hard uh, right-wing government of Israel thinks that they're not going to well, split the city. The, uh, the Swedish head of the EU, I mean, I have a problem with because I don't understand. I mean, I don't think it's like the right of the, anyone to tell the Israelis to the settlements. They're good, and it's their country. What right does, that's where they go. It's what they, it's their land to have and do what they want, you know? Sarah Palin, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Essentially her answer. <laughs> I think that was actually a little better than yeah, her answer. Yeah, it was a little stronger than her answer. <laughs> Uh, like any mention of the Palestinians, Sarah, or yeah. are they relevant in this situation? I think equation? because, you know, why not your land? Where does Barack Obama get off to let, tell them they're to do what, what live, build? I think good. And, you know, uh, a lot of people are going to travel to Israel more lately. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now, look, the thing is, uh, to get serious for a second here on this, um, I think that, that he's right, the head of the EU. Because Netanyahu is not going to come to the negotiation table. He's doing everything he can, building extra settlements, et cetera, and basically rubbing our face in it that I'm not going to come to the table. And if uh, and I'm so, and I'm going to try to make sure that the Arabs don't come to the table because I'm going to keep kicking them and kicking them so they they don't want to join this process. So then you begin to wonder, and I was wondering it before the Palestinians even brought it up. Hey, why don't they just say, okay, we now have a state? Right, we're right. a state. Yeah. Now I just need people to recognize us, mm -hmm. and then a lot of people will. Right? And you know what? Our state is the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem, as everyone expects. Right, yeah. you know, it's the, and then, and, and then you, your argument would be, uh, their argument would be, um, and I don't know, I'm certain it's not the right way to go about things, but their argument would be, yeah, our capital is East Jerusalem, and it's being occupied by Israelis. Yeah, that's right. it. Right, yeah. Yeah, and, and it is, and then look, and then that serves another I important purpose, because now the Israelis say uh, if um, Hamas or anyone else strikes out against Israeli citizens, they say, terrorism, terrorism, right? And they're right, right? Because they're hitting civilians, and I get it. And that's, if you believe in the concept of terrorism, that's the definition, right? But then if the Palestinians are an official state and their capital is East Jerusalem, and you have Israeli troops and cops in the middle of your capital, and you're, you know, pushing civilians around, uh, arresting civilians, detaining them, perhaps from time to time shooting them. Well, isn't that state terrorism? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the, the flip side is, you, you know, you can't have the Russians or the Canadians or the Native Americans say, no, 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 no our capital is Manhattan and the United States is occupying. <laughs> right, but, and I agree with that. And so right. that you got to keep these things in mind and we can't have people unilaterally declaring things left and right. But now, of course, if you do it by yourself, no one cares. But if you do it and it has international legitimacy and the EU accepts it and other countries accept yeah. it, then it begins to, you know, be a real state. Well, when you know, when you read in the paper vague uh, statements about, you know, sort of the United States, when we talked about, uh, and as you have often about whether Barack Obama would use his clout to, to force health care through or use the power of the presidency and the power of diplomacy. But this, this is an example of if it worked. It might not work, by the way, just because you use your power doesn't mean it works. But this is this is this is that's that's what diplomacy is. That is a that is a that is a threat from someone else to uh, design to apply pressure uh, theoretically, if I'm reading it right, to the to the Israelis. No, and that's exactly right because it doesn't have to work. It doesn't. The Palestinians don't have to declare statehood, and the European Union doesn't have to accept it. It's just another way of applying pressure to Israel so they come to the negotiation table and they get the negotiations going. So that's it's. If you ask me, it's very smart diplomacy. And if you care about peace, I think it's the right way to go. Um, and I'm not surprised that Netanyahu's government is not happy about it. So, all right, now let's go back to Afghanistan. We've got Drew Sloan on the line with us. He's a fellow at the Truman Project. And we want to talk to him about what we believe Obama is going to announce in about 15 minutes, that he's going to put in 30,000 more troops into Afghanistan with about a three-year timeline uh, for an exit strategy. Drew, welcome to the Young Turks. Uh, thank you very much. All right, now let me start with a very simple question of, do you think that's the right way to go? That's not exactly a simple question, but I think my answer is is basically yes. Um, I don't think the real question is how many troops 
are put into Afghanistan, I think, really is what, what is done with them. And I think that's really what we're kind of waiting to see. You know, the talk is all about troop numbers, and McChrystal wanted 80,000, 40,000, and there's another estimate of, you know, 10,000. But really the question is what, you know, what are they going to do with them? And so I think tonight we're gonna, we, need to, we need to hear from the president what exactly his plan is, where he's going to put these troops, how they're going to be phased in, and what exactly it is they're going to be doing. And I have thoughts on that, but we have yeah. to wait and see what, what he has to say. Well, l let's go to that, uh, because, of course, what you do with the troops is enormously relevant. Um, but what can we possibly do with them? Now, I was in favor of the Afghanistan war until, uh, I say this often, about a month ago, uh, when then I, after that Afghan elections, I'm like, okay, so if we win, then we make the Karzai government stronger. Have we really won? What have we won? That, that, that's, so that's what I mean by I don't know what you would do with 3,000 troops, 30,000 troops, or 300,000 troops. Well, you're right if you're, if you're saying that something has to be done about the Karzai government, um, you know, along with, with the troops. And I think that... I think tonight you also hear more than just talk about what the what the armed forces are going to do, but what are also the civilian side of um, our international security apparatus is going to do as well. And so I think you're going to hear the president talk a, a large bit about you know what state is going to do and how they're going to how they're going to integrate state with the military to build government capacity building operations. I also think that the president's going to announce that we're going to do more of a localized strategy, and that's really where he's going to you're going to see. An integration of the troops, and you're going to kind of get an idea of what is the troops going to be doing. I, you know, I don't know, but I would I would assume that the president is very much aware of the of the issues around the legitimacy for the Karzai government, and but particularly the corruption that exists within the government. And he's going to want to. He, he plan, you know, the planners have been trying to give him solutions about what we can do about that. And I think you're going to see more of a decentralized uh, government solution being put forth in this new strategy. Well, Drew, that brings up uh, two interesting points. And we're talking to Drew Sloan. He spent five years in the U.S. Army uh, and served in Afghanistan. He's now a fellow at the uh, Truman Project. Um, one is this idea of pressuring Karzai, uh, that if we say, hey, you've been a bad boy and we need you to be a good boy, that somehow that's going to work. I mean, it hasn't worked. Uh, I don't, maybe saying it hasn't worked at all is a little strong because he did agree to a runoff, which then never happened, right? Uh, but now that he's we've declared him the legitimate winner of the election um, and we've gonna announce that we're staying there for many many years and what what do we have over him I mean it seems like we don't have a lot of chips to pressure him with well it, it may not be that he actually needs pressure you know there is the option that what he needs is reassurance and that he is not going to be left you know high and dry stranded stranded in Kabul um, when we pull out precipitously in the next you know year because things got so bad. I think when Karzai was first elected in 2004, when that's when, that's when I, was, I served there, um, Afghanistan was relatively peaceful. And it was what we refer to as like the golden time in Afghanistan. And then it was just consistently abandoned for the last six or seven, you know, sorry, six or three or four years in which we could be focused, probably rightly so, on Iraq. Mm, if I no, was Karzai, so. just, what's that? No, wrongly so, but yes. <laughs> Right. Well, in terms of in terms of what our military was dealing with, that was had to be the, the focus, or we had to pull out of there. But but in terms of what you know, so there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot to be said. There's an argument you made at least that Karzai and the corruption that's been done is basically them ceding to their baser elements and kind of just you know thinking, well, the Americans going to leave. We've got to do whatever we can to secure power. Mm, so it may like... be that the reassurance of our presence there might encourage him, and through also feeding feeding. Uh, funds and efforts through the State Department and other civilian channels to teach governance efforts, that it may not be that we have to pressure, pressure, pressure. It may be that once the, you know, we alleviate the security situation, that the political growth um, kind of is free to emerge. Yeah. Drew, with all due respect, not buying it. Um, <laughs> because... Well, I mean, if you look at actually what we thought about Malki in Iraq, we thought they were, we thought he was, you know, Bush's own national security team thought that that Amalki was too weak and could never govern effectively. And now we look at him as he's a fairly strong ruler who has yeah. somewhat control over most of his country. So right. It, it, right, it's right, right, right. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, he has, he's a strong leader that does a pretty good job of crushing the Sunnis and will eventually get around to crushing the Kurds. So, uh, yes, we get stability, and I get the upside of that. I'm not naive about that. Uh, but, you know, there's a significant downside to it, too. And I don't think Karzai was sitting around being corrupt all these years with his brother being one of the biggest drug lords in the world. 
because uh, he wasn't sure America didn't make him feel safe enough. And now that we have, oh, then he's going to turn around and do good governance. That seems naive, doesn't it, Drew? Well, I think that's why you're going to see the president talk, you know, talk a lot about decentralizing the effort and pushing power you know, more to the kind of states where, in a lot of ways, we can exert more control because we have the troops, troops you know, stationed there and are, and are interacting with the government agencies on a day-to-day basis. Um, I do think you're, you're exactly right that there's, there's endemic corruption within the Afghan government. But I don't think that necessarily means that it has to stay that way forever. Um, right okay, now, so how do we do that, well. though? See, that's the thing, Drew. Like, I, I'm, I'm ready to listen, and I, and I want to be convinced of it. I really do. But I don't, I don't see how we do it, right? Because, you know, Matthew Ho, who's resigned, it was diplomat in Afghanistan, uh, it, talks about what uh, valleyism, right? Where if you go into their mm-hmm. valley, they fight you because you're there, right? And they're fighting us because we're fighting them, and we're fighting them because they're fighting us. And he said, look, the Russians built uh, hospitals and bridges and schools and roads, et cetera, and that didn't work. They just don't want us in their valleys. How do we get yeah, beyond I, that? With all due respect, my experience um, with Afghans was, was very much different than, than uh, Matthew Ho's experience. And that I didn't, and that I, you know, I absolutely believe in the valleys. I mean, there's, you know, people just don't leave their area, but they were not at all, the vast majority, unhappy to see Americans. And there was a, there was a huge difference in how they perceived the Americans and how they perceived the Russians. The Russians did build schools and, and hospitals and infrastructure, but they also, you know, did some of the most horrendous aerial raids and, and bombings and just basically did a scorched earth policy, you know, policy over much of the country, mined large swaths of it. And so there was a, there was a major difference between America and the Soviets. I think the biggest danger that we have, and, and Crystal is addressing this in his new strategy, is that, you know, we have been too loose with some of our JDAM missiles and bombing things that have resulted in civilian casualties. And that is kind of, that has been a negative perception, or led to a negative perception by some Afghans on the U.S. military. But by and large, I think if you ask most Afghans, they like the American presence. What they're worried about is that they have to balance the fact that the Americans are here during the day and the Taliban are there during the night. And the Taliban isn't going anywhere in terms of, in the, in the minds of most, of Af- most Afghans. The U.S. military, they don't have that kind of certainty. So I think what the president is trying to do right now is to give local Afghans some sense of security that America will provide them the opportunity to kind of repulse the Taliban. It will be there long enough to build up Afghan institutions to lay a a more permanent level of security. Uh, Okay. You know, then we build up the Afghan army. We provide some sort of stability and security uh, so that they can come to our side rather than the Taliban side. But I, one, I'm skeptical of that because we stay there three years, ten years. At some point, they're n- no one's dummy. They know we're going to leave, right? And they know that whoever's there locally is going to stay. But in the best case scenario, we build up another strongman in Karzai, who we're kind of trust and kind of don't trust. But hey, at least he brings stability. And I, and look, these are scenarios that I, I don't even necessarily mind. I, I get that there's compromises back and forth. But w- one of the other things that I'm worried about is, hey. We build this huge, what might be a 400,000 man, and when you include the cops, uh, Afghan army. And it's not whether they just trust us, it's also whether we trust them. What are they, I mean, how do we know they're not going to use that army against us one day? Well, um, I mean, the bottom, line, the bottom line answer is that you don't. But the, another answer is that with the addition of these new troops, that you will you will do what we did in Iraq, and that is that is integrate the training of the Iraqi or the Afghan security forces with the American security forces, and through that partnership, you build trust. And I mean, just like we train armies across the world that could you know that could eventually be used against us, so we we believe that by partnering you know with foreign governments and foreign militaries that we create bonds that last sometimes longer than the actual government that was in place when we started the training program. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if things go the right way, or if things go the wrong way, you just spent $75 billion of American taxpayer money to build an army that one day you're going to fight. Yeah, I mean, you're right. But I think, I think if, you, if you fall down that line, then you could say we spent, we spent billions of dollars supplying the Mujahideen to fight the Soviets in, you know, in Afghanistan in the 1980s, one, but then didn't spend the millions of dollars to do basic infrastructure programs that allowed the you know, that that would have kept Afghanistan from descending into chaos and allow the Taliban to come in. 
And so there are there's I mean there's arguments made that yeah we we could be spending twenty five billion dollars of the American taxpayer money and lead to a bad situation, or we could spend seventy five billion dollars and lead to a positive outcome. Um, I have faith in the president that he is that he has thought about this. He's talked to the state, he's talked to defense, um, he's talked to all the international uh, aid organizations, and this is the kind of the plan they've come together that will get us to a better place as opposed to the negative option that you're proposing. <laughs> well, Drew, I like that you're more optimistic than I am. And, um, and don't well, I, think, I think the bottom line is that Afghanistan hasn't always been a failed state. It's been a, lot, it's been a failed state for a lot of the time. Really? But, you know, in 2004, it was not, you know, it was a relatively, you know, peaceful country. The, we, they, they liked us there. The Taliban was relatively gone. Um, or at least it retreated, God, I wish and we, we, just, we ignored that for, for the last three or four years. And when I was, but you know, Drew, now I mean, we're at Drew, 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 but then wouldn't it have been great if we left then? <laughs> I mean, al-Qaeda wasn't in, uh, in Afghanistan anymore, and you're saying it was in a relatively good place. But then, you know, I mean, I say that partly kiddingly, but then if we had left then, well, then the Taliban would have come back like they did anyway. It just it yeah, seems it so pointless. It would have been good if we if we'd, if we'd poured in the appropriate amount of resources to capitalize on those gains. Well, we agree um, on that. We agree in, in on that, that. In that situation. No question we agree on that. All right, Drew Sloan, a uh, fellow at the Truman Project, and he served in Afghanistan. And we really appreciate your perspective. Thank you for coming on and talking to us about it. Thanks, Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. All right. Now, um, in just a couple minutes here, the president is going to uh, uh, start speaking on this, and we're going to finally find out what, in fact, he's going to say. We'll do a little analysis of it as well. And then at, right after the next hour, I'll be going on MSNBC. So. Uh, we'll carry that for you live on the website as well. All right, Young Turks.